This is the story of a remarkable woman, the daughter of a slave. On the streets of Victorian Cardiff, she saw great suffering and did something about it. She gave the rest of her life to helping people who were blind. She gave them work and the ability to earn a living. She's buried here in Cate's Cemetery. Francis Batty Shand, who grew up in the Caribbean. In 1865, she founded the Cardiff Institute for the Blind and the pioneering workshops, which helped to give blind people a new purpose and self-respect. She see a, an enigmatic lady, if you like. Uh, no photos, uh, very re little records, few in the local papers, obviously the Institute records, but not a lot about her, really. In her honour, the headquarters in Cardiff was called Shand House. The workshop here employed 70 men and women. The Queen came to Cardiff to meet blind and partially sighted people. And later, so did Princess Diana. After 60 years, Shand House closed last November and the Institute is getting a new home. Many people have happy memories of Shand House. Quite an iconic state-of-the-art building in its day with a living accommodation upstairs, then the workshops, uh, a shop in the front where they sold their goods and a hall at the back where they did all their entertainment. From the 19th century, the charitable institutes set up to help the blind provided places where people could live and work usually employed in traditional crafts. It's the only disability where you see um, institutes set up in towns. You know, just if you just take this area, there was uh, one in, in, in Newport, there was Cardiff, there was Swansea, there was pont de there was Abacare. You know, amazing number of institutes, all big, powerful buildings, you know, and, uh, and providing workshops and different things uh, for the blind. Right, we're going to do a quick uh, recall through reminiscence session and with that we're going to look at some very old equipment that we've got in the Institute and compare Bye. them with a new. The Royal National Institute for the Blind Cymru is creating an historical record and the Cardiff Institute is asking blind people in Wales to talk about their experiences and the way things have changed. We are trying to look as far back as we can, um, looking at their education, people's attitude, employment, their social life, how has it changed, you know, if they were young now, what would be the difference? Alan, in front of you, you've got quite an old contraption there. Uh, do you know that one? Yes, it, its actual name is a shorthand machine. It enabled blind people to write in a very strange form of shorthand at 120, 130 words per minute because of the way the springs are all put together. But I had one as a note taker at work and my boss came in and saw it. He said, I'm sorry, he said, but I don't want anything out of Henry V's time, a torture <laughs> machine, so can we get rid of it? We'll get something a bit more up to date. So I never saw one of these for very long, but they're horrible. Lift up the lid like that and then you can bring that side bit down. You feed the tape through that long line along there and the tape comes out the other end. It really is uh, it's right out of the, well, out of the arc. In an interview for the archive, Alan George describes his early years finding his way. Oh, sorry, I'm 64 years old. I've never known sight, never had sight. So I've always lived in the world quote, the world of the blind. So it's not been different to me, it's the only world I've known. I went away to a nursery school in Devon, and from there to uh, an ordinary school at Bridge End, well, School for the Blind at Bridge End. Did you have any uh, sighted friends at that time? No, no, I only, I, at home I only knew my family, and at, uh, away at the school, of course, I only knew the children who were at the school. In the years when Cardiff was growing into a world hub of coal and shipping, there was very little help for blind people. When Frances Shand arrived and saw their desperate predicament, she was moved to act. Frances was born in Jamaica in 1815. Her father was John Shand and her mother, 
an African European with whom he had seven children. Poor mother, she was left behind when John Shand retired to Scotland and took all the children with him. Well, Francis eventually came to Cardiff and lived here in Windsor Place with John, her brother. You imagine Cardiff at that time, I mean, it was that the docks were, you know, sort of very busy. You had the coal coming down, you had the iron ore coming down, you know, sort of accidents happening, industrial accidents happening. Um, and just to go back through our own history, you know, in the Institute's history, I was reading some of the files the other day, a six-year-old losing his sight in the 40s just before the National Health um, you know, uh, Service came in. And he only suffered from conjunctivitis, which is so treatable nowadays, but because the family couldn't afford it, he, he lost his sight. Frances Batty Shand started her venture here in Seven Road in Cardiff opening a two-room workshop for basket makers, giving blind people the dignity of earning their living. David Lovett was the first blind man to get a job at Francis Shan's workshops. With others, he made baskets, and Francis sold these to the shipping companies. She was a determined personality. In those times, she had to be. Quite a force, I think, because Victorian times, you wouldn't get a, a woman who's be, believed to be quadroon, uh, female, single, and setting up a charity. It just wasn't done. It was frowned upon. You gave the money, but you didn't actually set it up. But she was very hands-on. In 1868, Francis moved to a new building in Cardiff. Here, there were larger workshops, more employees, a growing business, and the Institute's mobile one-horsepower shop became a familiar sight. Francis worked for the charity until 1877, the year her brother died. She was devoted to him and couldn't go on. She left Cardiff and died in Switzerland in 1885, aged 69. Her body was brought back and she was buried here in Cate Cemetery, next to her beloved brother. In her will, Frances left a large sum of money to the Cardiff Institute for the Blind. Another handsome bequest went to the children's ward at what was then the new infirmary. It was called the Shand Memorial Ward in honour of her brother. The institute she founded had strong roots and continued to grow. At the start of the 20th century, there were a hundred blind men and women employed sewing and making baskets and ship's fenders, brushes. In 1927, the institute made the stockings for Cardiff's football team. And with those socks, Cardiff won the FA Cup. In 1941, bombers destroyed the Institute, but workers carried on elsewhere until Shand House was opened in 1953. I can actually remember it being built. I can remember the old houses that were there before. Um, like a lot of visually impaired people, I do have a good memory. And um, I also used to do some handicrafts, so I used to go in there and buy my cane and my tray bases and so on. I can also remember going to um, a craft afternoon held in the Cardiff Institute for the Blind. My first experience of typing was in the library, and also my first idea of learning Braille was in the library. I actually got a job eventually, so I, my contact with them wasn't as much then. Um, I worked in a Cardiff store called Evan Roberts. I worked on the lift for quite a few years because it was not easy to get a job anywhere else. And then eventually I w went up into the office. Uh, I, I was the telephonist. Then we were taken over and I was on the tannery then. But uh, I worked for 20 years in Evan Roberts. And then when I, when I lost my job because the company uh, went into, was sold and then it, went into liquidation and then I started doing a little bit more voluntary work at the Cardiff Institute for the Blind. Help for blind people was evolving. 
Less and less were they segregated in special workshops. More and more they integrated into mainstream society, thanks to advancing technology. There was no need for workshops, and in the end they were phased out. It's amazing how it has changed. I mean, everybody's concept of it. Oh yes, that's where they they sell bas they make baskets and they make mats and and, and yes, they did in the workshops. But uh, those days have gone. And given a choice today, if you went into schools with visually impaired or disabled children, they would probably say, "I want to do what everybody else does, but I may need a bit more support." After the break, Shand House and Princess Diana. Welcome back to the legacy of a compassionate woman. Shand House played a key part in improving the lives of those who needed its help. I came here in 1970, and the building was a lot different then. Um, and over those 40 years, we've changed from being an employer of blind and disabled people to a provider of direct services to blind and party-sided pe people throughout South Wales. So it's been a huge change for me. During his 40 years here, he showed visitors, like Princess Diana, how the lives of blind people were changing. We had a number of our blind members there trustees and uh, she was, you know, we talked about the work that we did in Cardiff over the many years that we've been established here. So it, the whole visit was a, a boost for you? It, it did help us, um, it helped our members, it, it pushed our profile up tremendously in Cardiff at that time. Three years later, a stroke of good fortune. A painting had survived the Blitz and was found in the basement. The Blind Basket Maker by Frederick Michael Halliday. I took it up to Sotheby's in London. Um, they gave us an estimate of 10,000. Uh, we had a phone call that um, it was probably going to go for a bit more. And could I attend uh, the auction, which would be in three, four weeks' time? Um, I went up there, and it was quite an amazing time that the picture actually went for 110,000 and was bought by Andrew Lloyd Webber. What a bonanza. So it, 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 and it, it was at that time, it was a tremendous boost to the finances and resources of the Cardiff and Sea for the Blind. In a time of advancing technology, the Institute ensures that its history is recorded for future generations. So, of course, Brailing nowadays, there is the Perkins. Normally, you're probably more yes. familiar with the Perkins yes. than with the Hammond, yes. aren't you? Um, and this is still in use. They're made by uh, for an IB, and it's a very popular machine. Yeah, that's right, yeah. I was in the army until uh, I was age 21 when I was wounded in, uh, in uh, inside Germany. I was blown up in a, in a tank there was injured and brought back to this country then. Uh, I had a total sort of loss of sight. My optic nerve was damaged. I had serious chest injuries. My, all my ribs were fractured and uh, I had a fractured pelvis. As he recovered, Norman learnt Braille and qualified as a physiotherapist. During his working life, he had little contact with the Institute. In the early days, it was um, very sort of patronising towards, I thought, very patronising towards um, blind people in many ways, but then as things were, went on and more uh, information sort of came about, and we had a new staff and uh, a new sort of welfare system came into the institute then, and uh, the uh, the mood changed quite uh, remarkably. When he retired, Norman took a deeper interest in the institute's work. He became its chairman, involved in its modern thinking and progress. We had committee meetings and, and uh, things there a few, few times a week. So I was always down there, really, and uh, got to know the, the staff really well. And uh, the uh, Cardiff Institute for the Blind was a, 
when, when it was in Shant House, it was uh, a wonderful setup, really. <coughs> we were all very, very sad when we, we had to uh, close down. The fact was, though, that after 60 years, Shand House was outdated. Things had changed. For example, the large rooms which housed the workshops and their equipment were now redundant. These are the baths which we used to soak, to fill just a little water overnight. We used to soak the wicker um, when we made the baskets, um, there's different thicknesses. Um, the weavers then would weave it into the whatever basket shape they wanted to, and then when it dried out, then it would keep its shape and be quite firm. And um, that's what gave it its strength. This was the basket weaving room, um, we used to have a number of, uh, probably up to 20 uh, blind people sitting around this room. They were on the go probably eight, eight hours a day. You have got, you've got one of these, yeah. have you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you've Many people had their way of life transformed by the Institute. One of them was Frank Creamer, now in his 80s. Yes. When I came over from Ireland first, I came, uh, I worked in the uh, flour mills, spillers down the, down the docks. So I was there for a good few years and uh, my eyes started failing me and uh, I wasn't able to do the job I was supposed to be doing with them. My eyes wasn't good enough. It's very depressing, like, you know. Came to um, get in touch with the Blind Institute then, uh, in 18, 1981, I think. And I, I got a job in the Institute then. That's how I started off at the Institute. They were good to me there. Like They, they could see I was a wee bit down, and they, they, were, they were very good, like, you know. The, we used to... Make work for the MOD, the Minister for Defence, making the, the, these things called fenders. Quite, quite hard work, like. After many years of service to generations of people with sight problems, Shand House is being turned into accommodation for the city's growing population of students. We're in the brush room, the brush assembly room, and there were big vats of boiling pitch um, the fibres were gathered, whatever size brush was needed, dipped into the pitch and then into the stock, the brush stocks with the holes already drilled into the, the brush stocks. The people we had working in here, you'd see them at the end of the day, they'd be a funny yellow colour from the, all the fumes from the pitch used to just stain their skin. We now got into the, the sewing room where we employed all our, our female staff. We had about a dozen blind ladies working here. On this side there were uh, sewing machines, we had a number of contracts making curtains and different sewing uh, products. And the female staff were only allowed to go down to the canteen through this door. They weren't allowed to wander the building at all, um, so it's a complete, completely segregated. We're on the top floor, in one, just coming into one of the um, bed sits there were. The idea was that um, our blind people would live on the top floor, work in the workshops the next two floors down, and sell the products um, through, the, through the shop on, on the ground floor. Uh, but they were fully occupied until um, the early 80s. I passed you over to Hannah. Well, she's got a lot of important things to tell us. Oh. Thank you, Hannah, for coming. Give her a clap. Oh. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very so much. Welcome. And as Bab said, I'm Hannah and I'm here from RNIB Cymru to talk to you about technology. Everyone listens when Hannah Rowlett speaks. She's 27 and very much part of the new approach to blindness, embracing the digital advances that help to shine a light in the darkness. I'm partially sighted myself and I don't think that um, I could live my life as independently as I do without technology um, around me. So this is how you can read a newspaper on a tablet device. Um, Page to offset, newsstand folder. Opening newsstand folder, newsstand, Guardian iPad edition. Do evil, MPs tell Google. Internet giants under fire over low tax bills despite billions in UK sales. The devices that we use nowadays are mainstream products that anybody can use, like smartphones, tablets, and ebook readers, um, where the manufacturers have actually built in the accessibility function. So I can use the same device as any of my friends or family. Yeah. 
that gene, yeah. okay? You need to use it with one finger at a time, otherwise it gets a little bit confused. We know from research that we've done with our members that for, our, for older, blind and partially sighted people, four out of five of them believe that their sight loss means they can't use this technology. Partly this is kind of awareness and it's simply that they, they haven't been shown that the products that are available, which is where I come in with, with my job. My job is to go out and speak to groups, chat to them about what technology does and to give them demonstrations for them to have a play with it. So technology exists to make your life easier. And in a way, that's more so for somebody who's blind or partially sighted, because it allows them to see what's happening in the world, which maybe they can't see with their own eyes. Mm. Pages. Well, that's amazing. What difference would things like this have made to your childhood? Well, I think they probably would have made a massive difference. We didn't have smartphones then, but all the mobile phones my friends had, I was there, I had to use a magnifier with my phone, and it, it's just, it's not that cool, really. Whereas now, you know, you can have a, a student who's blind or partially sighted sat in class with their iPad and to use the camera to zoom in on, on, the, on the, the, the whiteboard. Um, and it's a cool device, it's not something special. Now, another chapter opens in the Institute's story as it moves into new premises shared with RNIB Cymru. The number of people in Britain having difficulty with their sight, that's one person in 30, is increasing. The service founded in Wales by that remarkable woman from Jamaica has vital work to do. Next time, welcome to 1973.